Okay. Um, a, a good skill to have, a good good ability to have, is the ability to look at problems that you have solved in the past and compare them with problems that you have to solve now and see what's the same and what's the different. All right? Because uh, a lot of programming problems have a lot of similarities to them. All right? Some details might be different, but, you know, it, it, it's rare that you'll get any programming task that is totally unlike any programming task you've done before. All right? It happens, but it's rare. So, you may not believe me, all right? But we've seen everything we need to do to do lab two. We've just seen it in disguise. We've seen it in a different form. All right. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to take we're going to rewind a little bit and take a look at what we did last week, and then I'm going to talk about what we did in last week in sort of general terms and show you how what we did last week connects to what the assignment is, and then depending on how that goes, I might have another example, and then we'll go on from there. So let me pull down the example we had last week so that we can take a look at it. Look, uh, at it. Just to remind you about it. If this means that you have to take an extra day to get the assignment done, that's okay because we missed a day of class. All right. I had count on, count, counted on. Um, let's see. switch guy that's on the ball this semester. That's always a plus, all right? Because a lot of times, you know, I'll ask the person and like, um, you know, then like I'll like have to ask them then I'll like ask them again like week two and then I'll ask them again week three. Well, you're on it. As soon as you see the projector on, you're on the light. So, great job. All right. There's no extra credit for that, by the way. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you have an 89.999, I'll round up to an A, all right? <laughs> that, that's the extra credit. Um, so let's open up Visual Studio. And again, I want to review how we open this up because um, it may not seem like a big deal, but different people sometimes open up the, the websites in different manners. So I want to show you the easiest, most straightforward way. You wouldn't go, for example, and open up a file individually. You want the whole thing to open up as a website, as, a, as an application, because you want the web config file and you want all the associated related files. So I'm going to go and say open website. It's in this folder, but again, notice it's in a subfolder. To review, it should be the folder that you're opening should be the folder that contains the web config and all your other files. All right, so let's go, and that's actually two folders deep, so I'll go open website. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Open up that, open up that, and away we go. You should see then underneath the folder or the application that you open, you should see your files, including web config. I'm going to set this to be the start file again. Set a start page. And this is our little conversion that will convert between uh, either Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit. So let's run this. I have a bunch of uh, validators and stuff on here. All right. So let me run this. I 
can enter in a temperature. I can select from the drop down what I want. All right. I can click convert. And I get my answer. All right. So that's what um, that's what this this code does. If we look at the code that does that, what do we have? We have a button on the page. We have some validators. All right. We'll not really worry about those right this minute, but we have some validators. We have a convert button. If we double click on it, we see we have a button click event. And what does that button click event do? It looks at the value of the drop down, then it does something with the value of the drop down. All right? Um, and then finally, we end up displaying the output by changing one of the properties of the label on the screen. All right, we set the text of the label to the answer that we want. All right, so that's what we did here. Let's go and let's, let's write what we did in very general terms and compare this to your lab two assignment and see what the similarities are and what the differences are. It's always good, I, I, I say sometimes, that you got to take inventory as a programmer. You got to take an inventory of the problem that you have. What? Yeah, there you go. What you know about the problem, what you don't know about the problem. So you take inventory, all right? And then, then, then that that is good for a number of reasons. For one thing, that shows you what you need to focus on to to understand. So let me draw, essentially, what the temperature conversion program involves. There's a text box, there's a drop down, there's a button, and then there's a label. All right? We have code on the button. That code does a couple things. Number one, it uses the value of the drop down to figure something out. In other words, the value of the drop down is important because that sort of determines what's going to happen next what the calculation we're going to perform, and so on. So the value, the code on the button uses the value of the drop-down to decide what to do. All right? In this case, what to do is to calculate A or calculate B. Calculate Fahrenheit to centigrade, calculate centigrade to Fahrenheit. Then we display the output, and we do that by changing the property of one of the controls. All right? In our case, what property do we change? We change the text property of the label. And we set it equal to some value. Any of these questions like this, where you're doing something and displaying the output, the way that you change your page is by changing the properties of the controls on that page. So how do we change this page to show the right answer? Well, we do our calculation based on the value of the drop-down, and then we change the text property of the label to reflect the answer. All right, let's see how your lab two is different. Your lab two is different this way. We have a drop-down. and a button. All right? So, so far, similar, right? Drop down a button, drop down a button. All right? We don't have a label, we don't have a text box, that's fine. 
Instead of a label, we have three panels. Why three panels? Well, you have three topics. Your topics are um, ASP.NET, SQL, and database design. So we have three panels. All right. The idea is we want to show one of those panels at a time. All right. We want to start out with all of them being invisible. And then based on what they select, we want to make one of the panels visible or another panel visible, or so on. So we have, instead of a label, we have three panels. Why a panel? Because the code that we have for each of our topics could be a bunch of stuff, right? We could have an image. I'm so happy that I'm working on database design. We could have a heading. We could have a paragraph. We could have a list of links. Do we absolutely need a panel? No. All right. We could individually make these elements invisible. All right. We could go in and say, make the picture invisible, make the uh, headline, uh, heading invisible, make the paragraph invisible, make the list invisible. We could do that, but by putting a, uh, all the stuff on a panel, that's one thing that we need to make invisible or visible. If we make it invisible, then all the stuff gets invisible. So it doesn't matter if we have one or a hundred things on the panel. We make the panel invisible, poof, everything goes away. So that's really the reason to use a panel is that it allows you to group a bunch of things together that you want to treat the same way. In our case, the way that we're treating it is we're showing it and hiding it. Depending on the problem, there could be other things that we'd want to do to it as well. All right? So how do we show and hide a panel? What makes a panel visible or invisible? A visible property. A, visible, a, a property called the visible property. There's a commercial, um, uh, I don't know, a, a few years back, I think it was for the Apple, uh, Apple iStore or whatever, where they, they said, there's an app for that, there's an app for that, there's an app for that. Well, sort of the thing that we're going to repeat in this class is there's a property for that. If you want to change certain characteristics of an element on the screen, there is likely to be a property for that. Property. What is the property that we used on the label to change, to change it? The text property of the label, right? So that's what we changed. What are we going to do with the panels? We're going to change the visibility property, all right, or the visible property, rather. And we'll simply make it true if it's supposed to be visible, and we'll make it false if we uh, make it invisible. So. What is our code going to look like on the button here? We're going to have code. We're going to use the drop down. Use the, the drop down. Use the drop down to figure out what to show and what to hide. We're then going to output. In this case, our output is showing the selected tab hiding the rest. If I could say that in more general terms, we're going to change properties of controls. So now if we compare these two tasks, on a higher level, they look like the same task. Right? We have a drop down, we have a button. You press the button, something happens. <clears throat> the something that happens depends on what we've selected on the button. What is ultimately going to happen? There might be some inter 
intermediary steps, but what's ultimately going to happen? Our page is going to change. How is the page going to change? It's going to change by us changing the properties of one or more than one control on the page. In this case, we're going to hide stuff. In this case, we're going to set the text property. Set it. So it's really, taken at a high enough level, it's really the same problem. All right? Any questions about what we've talked about so far? I'm going to do still another problem that is the same problem, all right? And the reason I'm doing this is, is again, keeping in mind we missed a, a class. Um, one of the things that I like to emphasize um, is that you can change, like, any property of the elements on the screen, all right, of the controls on the screen. So anything you like, you can change. How do you get the properties? Well, IntelliSense tells you the properties, right? It also shows you, if you select the item, it shows you a list of properties. You can set those properties two ways, all right? You can set those properties through the Visual Studio, through the IDE, to give them an initial value. So what was the initial value of the, of the label? Nothing, right? Nothing. We started off with a blank label. So we set the initial property of the label to, to nothing. What will be the initial value of your panels? Not visible. Visible equals false. All right? So we can set those properties through uh, Visual Studio to give them an initial value. We then can write code to change any of those properties. All right? So in the first example, in the conversion, we change a property to the result of our calculation. And the calculation depends on whether they picked Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit. Okay? In the second example, the property that we're going to change is we're going to change the visible property. And if they've selected the one tab, we're going to show that tab, make it visible. If they selected another tab, we're going to make it visible, and so on. Um, again, we're picking something on the page, and we're changing a property of it. So we can set the property to an initial value, and we can change the property to whatever we want it to be. Let's take another example. All right. And we'll see how this fits this model. I'm going to have three pictures. All right. I think I have two pictures of a lion and one picture of an orangutan that I took at the zoo so many years ago. All right. So, I'm going to have three pictures. I'm going to have an image on the page. The image is going to start out blank. There's going to be no image there. All right? When I select, there'll be three choices, image one, image two, and three in the drop down. Right. <coughs> When I pick one of these and click select pick, it's going to change the image to be whatever image I selected. So one of the lion, two of the lion, three of the orangutan. All right? So and there's going to be one image control. We could do this a bunch of different ways. We could even do this not using server-side code. We could write JavaScript code. But in this example, we're going to do it this way. It's going to be one image control. Think of an image control as being like a picture frame. <coughs> All right? When we have an image on a page, usually we think we have an image on the page. Really, we sort of have a picture frame on the page. And we can put different pictures in that picture frame. 
So some of you that may have done other programming have done like image galleries where you have uh, a thumbnail and a big picture and you, you swap the image and the image and so on. This is sort of like that, except it's being done on the server side. So, we click the button. It's going to be code on the button click. All right. What is that button going to do? It's going to use the value of the drop down. To do something. Well, use value of drop down to figure out what to show. That's the same thing, right? And in this case, what it's going to use it to do is decide what pick we're going to show. Two. What are we going to do? We're going to output. How are we going to output? We're going to change. property or properties of the image control to the proper image. Now at least one of the properties we're going to change is the property of the file that we're going to show. So that's one thing that we're going to change. We might change other things as well, and we're going to take a look at that. All right? Questions about what we're going to do. We have a drop down. We're going to pick which image we want. Click select. We're going to display that image here. All right? And if you think about it, well, it's not the same as that, but it's similar. We're using the value of the drop down to decide something, what we're going to do. We are then writing code to change properties of things, all right? And to change the property of the thing, you need to point to the thing that you want to change. I want to change this image. I want to change this panel. I want to change this panel. I want to change this panel. You point to the thing that you want to change, and you set the property. And those are the same properties you can set through Visual Studio to give them initial values. Our code can go and make those dynamic, make those change depending on something that the user did or other circumstances. We could have a different picture for a different time of the day, right? We could have a pleasant sunrise to get you ready for that long drive in the work. Or we could have, uh, I don't know, a nice little picnic scene for lunchtime or, uh, you know, whatever. All right? So let's go and let's create this guy. I get a lot of mileage out of these pictures because I use them, I believe, in 2.16 and probably in 2.32. So you'll get to know these animals fairly well by the end of your career here at LC, depending on what classes you take. Yeah. So here's my images. For now, I'm going to just bring these out to the desktop. So there they are. Lion. See, I was a lion. There is uh, another lion. And here's an orangutan. With a baby orangutan. Aww. How nice. How nice, yeah. All right, so those are our three images. So, my application is here. All right? I need to get these images in incorporated with the rest of the application. All right? So, I can do that by dragging them into this folder, 
or I can make a subfolder for them. All right. Probably would good, be good to make a subfolder for them. So I'm going to make a subfolder in here called images. And I'm going to drag those three guys into there. All right. So now those images are incorporated with my application so I can get to them. It's important thing to realize is, is for you to be able to access additional files, whether they be CSS files, images, audio files, videos, whatever, they need to be part of your application. So you need to put them in that folder someplace or another. All right, so let me go into my app. Notice it doesn't show this over here. I'm going to click refresh. So now I see the images folder. So if you bring external files in, uh, it's a good idea to hit refresh so you can see them over there. All right. It may be, for example, uh, when would you use something like this? It may be, for example, that, that maybe you are working on one part of your task and someone else is working on the CSS. All right. So they may give you a CSS file and, and you would bring it in that way. You'd copy it into your application and it's important to hit refresh so that you can see it. All right, let's make a new page. So let's go up here. File, new, file. It is going to be a web form. We do not have a master page, so we're not going to do that yet. We are going to place code in a separate file, and it is going to be C sharp. And the page I'm going to call Zoo. One thing that I say uh, uh, th th that I want to stress, and I'll do my best to do this myself, is the first page of your application should be called default, default.aspx. That's like your home page, all right? So consider default to be your home page, and, and, and just take the name default.aspx. Each subsequent page, Visual Studio will want to name default 2, default 3, default 4, default 5. Go in and give those meaningful names. Don't simply leave them as default 2, default 3, default 4, default 5. Because if you took a break from this project and came away a week later, you got no idea what default 3 is versus what default 5 is. All right? But if I could come back to this next week, oh, Zoo, that's the one with the Zoo pictures on it. All right? I know immediately. So give it a meaningful name. All right, I click Add. I was at this set. All right, I'm going to go on this page then, and I'm going to go and I'm going to copy over the CSS, just so that everything has the same CSS. Give it a title. These things like making sure everything has the same CSS file and actually giving it a title and making sure that the page has a, has a, a, a reasonable name, these are all little things. I got to take you any longer to do your assignment to, to do these things. No, no amount of significant time is going to be spent doing these things. It just takes a second. But it, it increases the value of the site, increases the quality of the code of the site by a lot. All right. So, um, one thing that this kind of uh, kind of observe as a teacher, it is appears like some students think that like if they spend two more minutes extra on an assignment, that that's a horrible thing. All right. That they want to get by with the absolute least they can get by and still get a good grade. All right. That's just something you observe. You know, as a teacher, um, take an extra couple minutes to make the page look good. You know, take a couple of extra minutes to apply a CSS file that looks like a completed page so it doesn't just look like some um, dash together thing, all right? Um, it, it just really just, just makes, you know, makes it so much better. All right. Again, I think it's good to be able to flip back and forth between the two modes, the design mode and the code mode. I, you know, I find 
it will work, you know, uh, I find that I like to do either way, you know. So I'm going to go under standard, I'm going to drag over my drop down list, and I'm going to drag over my button, and I'm going to drag over an image. All right. Let's go and look at the drop down. All right. The drop down. I'm going to edit items. All right. This is what we'll do for now. Later on, we're going to actually bind this to a data source. So we're going to use choose data source. But right now, because we're manually putting in the items, we're going to put in edit items. So I'm going to add my first item. The text for it is going to be lion pick one. And the value doesn't really matter what I pick. I'll, I'll just make the value equal to one. All right. Now remember, what's the difference of this? The difference of this is the text is what the user is going to see. The value is what the code is going to see. So. If I simply display one, two, three, a user's not going to know what it means. But at least with this, they have an idea that the first picture is a picture of a line. Let's go and add the second one. I'll make the value of that two. We'll make the value of that three. I'm going to change this button to say show picture. And I'm going to run it. Of course, there's no code here, right? So nothing's going to happen, right? It's, it's going to show my drop down. It's going to show the button. Uh, yeah. But it's not going to do any of the swapping because I haven't written the code for it yet. So I'm going to go up here and click debug. Uh, debug and let's see what that does. All right, it shows me this page. Why does it show me that that page? Because it say, I said show it startup convert. So I can just go and change that to the name of my page, which is Zoo. And it will show me the drop down. I can pick. I can hit the button. Of course, nothing happens. All right. Let's look, just for laughs, at the HTML code that got generated. I really think it's important to, to know and be aware of the HTML code that gets generated. Because remember, that's what gets delivered to the client. All the code on the server side runs, but its job is to produce its output HTML to use. So let's scroll down. And we see an image, but it has no source attribute. All right? We have to decide if we like that or not. I guess that's okay, because it's not showing anything. It's not showing a broken image. But we could do this instead. I can make it so it doesn't show the image at all. It doesn't show even an image tag. How do I do that? I click on the image, I go down to properties, and I set visible to false. Watch what happens when I set the visibility to false when I go and run this. Okay. And notice there's like a missing place there. All right. Uh, the reason for that is if we view the source, now there is no image tag. So that's an important piece of information to know. If you set something as invisible, it doesn't simply hide it on the web page. The server doesn't put it on the web page, which probably want to do in a case like this, because I wouldn't want to put an empty image tag on my page. I'd want to, if, if there's no image to display, I will want to 
do that. I will want to not show anything. All right, not even show any image tag at all. All right, so let's make this thing work. Yes. How are we going to make this thing work? Well, we obviously have to write code. We've set the basic structure of our page and the controls that we need to solve this job. All right, what we need to do now is go and change the properties of that image. Well, what are the properties of the image that are probably going to be relevant here? Well, let's look at them. There's an image URL, and that is the URL of the image to be shown. That sounds like one that would want to change, right? Sure. The visibility property. Yeah, we're going to want to make it visible so the user can see that. And maybe even the alternate text, right? Because for, remember, for accessibility reasons, we want to put our alternate text there. So if someone is accessing this with a screen reader, they get an idea of what's on the page. So there's three different properties that we want to change. They're all initialized. Well, two of them are initialized to nothing because we don't have an image to start out with. The other two, or the other property, is set to invisible. So what is this called? It's the idea of this. It's called image one. Again, good idea to give it a meaningful name. So I'm going to give it an idea of image animal. All right. That way, if I had other sort of images on the page, I'd know which is which. It would be tough to say, uh, you know, um, um, you know, um, have image one through 26 and have to memorize that the first one was for the animal, the second one was for this, the third one was for that, and so on. So I'm going to give all of these more meaningful names. So instead of drop down list one, I'm going to say drop down list image chooser. And I'm going to call this button submit. These are things that, again, how much longer does it take to do this? Even with me talking, it only takes a minute or two to do. But later on, when you or someone else comes to maintain this code, if you give things meaningful names, you're in a much better uh, situation than just taking the defaults. All right? Okay. I'm gonna, while, I, while I'm remembering, I'm going to set this to my start page so I don't have to... Um, do that every time. All right. So how do I get to my code for uh, the button? Click on it. Oh, yeah. Click on it, of course. Actually, double click. Double click. Okay, double click it. And notice what it does. It does two things. One of the things is obvious. One of the things isn't so obvious. First thing it does is it creates in my ASPXCS file an empty function. All right? So there's a function that we can put my code in to do what it needs to do. Where do you think the other thing it does is? Where's the other code change that it made by me double clicking on that button? Well, how many files are there associated with this web page? Two, right? This is one of them. So where do you think the other change is in? HTML. The other one, yeah, the ASPX file that generates the HTML. Correct. So where is that code? That code is actually on the button, and it's an on-click. This is a server-side on-click, which means that when it gets clicked and it gets submitted to the server, this code will execute. If you're not careful, you can click on stuff and create functions. Later on, you look and say, oh, I don't need that function. Let me delete it. But if you don't delete it from here as well, you get an error. Let me show you that. That's a classic thing I get called over for lab. Let's say I'm going and playing around here on this page, and I'm like thinking, hmm, I wonder if I do something with this. Notice I double-clicked. It gave me a function here. All right? So later on, if I'm looking at my code behind, or if I'm looking at my uh, ASPX page, I might look and say, 
unselected index item change, oh, never mind. I might look and say, oh, it created an empty function. Let me get rid of that. Boom, I get rid of it. Now I go to run this. It doesn't let me. Why not? Because that function is still used in the ASP function is still in the ASPX file. So I have to get rid of that from here as well. So when you create a function, two things happen. Is it creates a shell of the function in the .cs file and it associates the control with the function. It wires them together. All right, so that's how the server knows when you click this button, this code happens. Okay, so let's go and put the code that we want into here. First thing I'm going to do is what? I'm going to look at the value of the dropdown. All right. So I'm going to have a series of if statements. You can use a case statement if you want doesn't really matter to me, um, or select case. But I'm going to say if. How do I tell the value of the dropdown? There's a property for that, right? So how do we get the property of something? First, we have to point to the object. Well, what is that dropdown called? It's called dropdown image chooser or something like that. So I'm going to start typing in. And oh, drop down list image chooser. So drop down list dot, what property do I want to use? Well, again, it shows me a whole list of properties. This is one of those things that if you do this often enough, the main properties you're going to memor you know, have memorized. You're going to remember them. The other properties, yeah. um, you might have to look up, like what does access key do? And what does this do? And what does that do? Well, if you remember from the other example, the value of the thing that got selected is the selected value. So if the selected value equals 1, we want to do something. What do we want to do? We want to do three things, right? We want to make the image visible because it was invisible before. We want to set the URL of that image to the proper URL. That is the URL of the lion. All right? That's number two. Number three, we want to set the alternate text. Alternate text. So, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to say, how do I point to the image? I use the name of the image. What is the name of the image? Image animal. What's the property for visible? Visible equals true. What is the property for the URL? Image dot, oh, image animal dot, we can search through these things. Image URL, it's going to equal images slash one dot jpeg is that correct I think it's correct all right because the page is in this folder how do we get to the image from there we go to the directory called images and the picture that we want is called one dot jpeg finally how do I set the alternate text image animal. So we point to the control and then we say what property we want to change. And in this case, alternate text equals picture one of lion. Picture one of the lion. Okay. 
we're going to see what we're doing here. Grab the value of the drop-down. How do we grab the value of the drop-down? Well, we have to use the right property to do that. It's all about controls or objects and properties. What's the object that we're interested in? We're interested in the drop-down list. What's the name of the drop-down list? Drop-down list item chooser or image chooser. What property are we interested in? We're interested in the property that the user picks. So I use selected value or the value that the user picks. What is the values of selected value? Well, when we created the list, we gave the first thing a value of 1, the second thing a value of 2, the third thing a value of 3. So if it's 1, we want to make it true. We want to display um, this image and set that alternate text. We're going to duplicate this code for 2 and 3. this and see if it works. All right. Hmm. It's not showing anything right away. Mm, weird. We'll fix that in a minute. We'll see what's wrong. So I pick orangutan and baby and click show picture. And there's the orangutan and baby. All right. We pick line one picture and show. Line two picture. And if we were to look, the alternate text is, is also set to the proper value and is visible. Questions on this? It's all about finding the control that you want to change and setting the right property. Now, let's go back and talk about what we saw when we first ran it, where the lion picture doesn't show. All right? I'm going to go and, yeah, go ahead. Now, when you hit show picture, is it putting image on top of image, or is it actually hiding the other images? Really good question. All right? That is a very good one. Hmm. Let's break this down using our diagram. Don't you love when you ask a question and like you think it's going to be like, yeah, it does it that way or it does it that way. And instead, like you're going to get like a whole three-hour presentation on exactly what it does. But I think it's important to do this. It won't be three hours. It's probably a couple hours at, at tops. All right. Um, it's important to understand this because it's important to understand what's really going on and how the client and the server interact. Okay. So, you have a client. who is through the internet, even though the internet really is our own machine here, but it's theoretically through the internet, to the web server that has the ASPX and ASPXCS file. The ASPX file has, and we'll only look at, we'll only talk about the image, all right? It has initialized an image with a blank URL that's invisible and no alternative text. All right? It has code on the button. When the button got clicked, that looks at drop down. 
and sets URL, visible, and alt text. So, the client requests the zoo page the first time. So they type in zoo.aspx. This is the first time they're loading the page. Have they made a selection on the dropdown yet? Of course not. This is the first time they're loading the page. Have they clicked the button? Of course not. That is the first time they're loading the page. They haven't even seen the button yet. So what does the server do? The server runs out and says, well, we'll grab this ASPX and make an HTML file for it. The user did not click the button, therefore I am not going to execute this code. And what's it going to do? It's going to actually see that this is invisible, and the first pass, it creates an HTML page with no image. That's why the first time we requested the page, it was blank. Because it requested it, the ASPX page that contains the HTML and server-side controls, was created to create an image that had no URL and is invisible. If it's invisible, the server doesn't even bother sending it. All right. And we did not click the button, so this code doesn't execute. So I go and I pick my second pass. I pick Lion 2. I change the drop-down, but don't click the button. Does anything happen? No. Why not? Because the code to change that lives on the server, and it gets initiated when a request is made to the server, and the server has clicked the button. So if I change that and don't click the button, nothing happens. I click the button. Well, I would request I call back the same page. This is called a callback. So I call zoo.aspx, but this time through, my dropdown has a value of 2, and the button has been clicked. So the server goes and does its thing, and it creates the HTML page. It creates the image, again with a blank URL, again with invisible and again with nothing in the alt text. But alas, the button has been clicked. The yes. user has made a selection in the drop down. Therefore, it's going to take the selection the user made in the drop down, namely number two, and change this image to put in a URL to make it visible and to set the alt text. So in pass two, it creates HTML page containing the one image that contains the second picture. So now if we view it, there's an image tag on that page and the parameters are set for picture two. I change the picture three in the third pass. Click the button. Goes over here. Creates the page again. All right. Each time it's creating, it's generating the whole page over from scratch. The button has been clicked. I've selected item number three. So set the URL, the visible, the alt and send back to the, the client an HTML page with one image with image 3 in there. So to answer your question, it's not like it's overlaying the image. It's recreating the page each time each time containing one image that has the proper parameters in it. All right. 
What you're talking about of like overlaying or making it invisible or whatever would be more like a JavaScript solution for it, where we kept the same page loaded and we just had some client side code that didn't even bother going back to the server. In a case like this though, it's requesting a brand new web page. All right, when we submit that form, it goes back to the server and it calls zoo.aspx again. All right, so every time we click the button, it goes back to the server and recreates the page. It's just that it's going to recreate it with the proper parameters in there. All right, which brings us back to the issue that we had of it not showing any image right off the bat. So it's awkward. What if we wanted to view image one? We'd have to hit the submit button. That's a little bit of a, of a goofy, uh, goofy uh, situation. How could we fix that? How could we fix it so it brought up initially image one with all its parameters so that we didn't have to click the submit button? Let me show you what I mean. Right now, again, remember, the initial load User hasn't clicked the button, user hasn't seen the drop down, therefore it creates the HTML with no image. How could we get it to create the HTML with the default image, sort of, the first image on the list? Yeah. Well, we could write code in the page load. All right, that would be one possibility. The other way we could do it would be for us to simply initialize those values in the 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 control to begin with. In other words, I could go to the image and I could say initially when this page first loads, I don't want it to be invisible. I want it to show images slash lion one. Let me show you what it means first of all, how, what the problem is right now and then I'll show you how to fix it. The problem now is when it loads this page it shows lion pick one, but there's no picture there. To show lion pick one, we'd have to click show picture. It's kind of awkward. It should display it right away. If it's going to show lion pick one in the drop down, it should display lion pick one. So what I'm suggesting to solve is we could write code. There's a number of different events that happen, and we could write code as soon as the page loads to put that in there. That would be one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to put and simply initialize those properties to the properties for Lion 1. I initialize them as being empty to begin with. Well, if uh, probably a better way to do it would be to simply set those properties to the default image, make sure it's visible. And now, when I run it, it gets loaded with that image. I can change it if I want to, but if I did not specify, and if I, the first time I load the page, it would show the first image. That's one way to do that. All right, is I could I could do that way. All right. There's another way I could do that. I could give a dummy value in the drop down. All right, that said, um, that said, um, you know, please select one of the following images. All right, either one of these two is an appropriate solution unless someone tells you otherwise. All right, um, so let's look at how we could do that. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to remove those things again. I'm going to remove those properties. And I'm going to put a dummy property in the drop down. I didn't mean to double click on it. Again, I'm going to get rid of that. Got to remember, though, to go and get rid of it here as well. I could 
go through the GUI and put this in. But just for laughs, I'm going to go to the source code and put it in. And I'm going to put an item zero. That's going to be a dummy item. That's going to say, please select one of the following. All right. So I go and run this. All right. So now it doesn't show anything, but that's more reasonable because it's not the drop down isn't showing lion one. It's showing um, the dummy value. So I could pick lion one, show picture, and so on. What if I pick, please select one of the following? Well, there's no code to handle that, so it just keeps the old picture. I kind of don't like that, right? I kind of want to make, give an error message that says they don't pick something, you know, hey, please select something. What kind of validator do you think that would be? Let's look at our validator choices. A compare validator, custom validator, range validator, regular expression validator, or a required fields. The other one is just a summary display. So which of these? Compare, custom, range, regular expression, or required field? It's a required field. They want to make sure they pick something. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag my required field on, on the page. And I'm going to set the properties for it. My error message is must select picture you want. We'll go and run this, and I forgot to say what control is validating. All right. Even though there's only one possible, because you can't validate a button, I still have to say that. I have a feeling every time you get that error, Bill Gates gets an email message and he has a little bit of a chuckle. I forgot to pick the required validator control. Okay, so there we go. I click show picture. I don't get the error message. Why do you suppose I don't get the error message? We did everything right. We set up a required field validator um, for that control. We set up... Uh, you know, um, put our error message in and all that. Does the value have to equal zero to get that? Ah, you're, you're definitely on the right track. Here's why we don't get an error. Drop downs always have a value, right? They're not like text boxes. Text boxes, if you don't put anything in them, they don't have a value, right? They have nothing as a value. So we can put a required validator on those really easy, all right? A drop down always has a value. Now, this might be different than doing desktop coding, all right, uh, where you, um, where you, um, um, I think you can create a dropdown and say it has no value, I think. But anyhow, a dropdown in web environment always has a value. So what I have to tell the validation control for a dropdown is what's the value that represents the initial value. In other words, what value means that it's empty? And in our case, the value that means it was empty is zero. Zero. So I go and run this now, and I click that, and then I get the error message. 
What if we want that error message to stand out? We can do it with CSS, right? Well, if you remember last time, we created a class for error. All right? So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to go in and simply set for this control, the CSS class of error. So by using CSS, I'm going to have a consistency on all my errors. All right? If I use the ASP.NET properties, I'd have to go and make sure manually every error was formatted the same way. Yes? I think you might have already shown us this, but is there a way to get rid of that space between the drop yeah. and the box? Yeah. Uh, I did, but it's like, it's like really, um, it's a little bit obscure. All right? It's, it's not obvious. First of all, the question of how to make anything on the page be different is probably what property do I have to change? All right, so in this case, the property that I have to change is the display property of the control. Static means it will always take up that space whether there's an error message there or not. If I want it to only take up space if it is, um, um, if there's an error message there, I'm going to put dynamic. And then when we run it, it doesn't take up the space unless there actually is an error message. One other, we're going to talk about two other things today. All right? I have six minutes, piece of cake. All right? First thing, remember what I said about these validations can happen either on the client or on the server. So we have to put a little catch in here in case client-side validated validation is turned off to say, I only want to do this code if is valid. Doesn't really affect anything. Doesn't really affect anything. But you don't want to do that code. You don't want to execute the code if the error detection, if the validation happens on the server side because the client has client side validation disabled. So just as a rule of thumb, just wrap all of your button code in if is valid. All right? Sort of a given. Last thing is, is from a user interface perspective, do I really want that button? That makes it a little bit clunky. Ideally, I want to pick lion, and then I have to go and click show picture. Right. Now, depending on the kind of operation you're doing, sometimes that's okay. For example, if it was a search that was going to take a long time to run on a database, I might want to have them click the button to confirm that they really want to do that search. But for something small like this, ideally, I would want that drop down to, uh, as soon as I made a change to it, have the code uh, kick in. All right? So how do I do that? Well, first thing I want to do is I'm going to get rid of the button. I'm going to go and delete the button. And I'm going to go and run the page. Well, nothing. Why is nothing happening? She don't have an action associated with clicking on that. That's half the answer. I don't have code associated with changing the drop-down. All right? Where's the code associated with? The code is associated with clicking the button. We no longer have a button. All right? So let's go and move that code. I'm going to double-click on the drop-down, and I'm going to get a drop-down list item change selected index changed. 
Well, in other words, when they change the value of the index, we go out and we do something. So I'm going to go and copy this. Oops. And I'm going to get rid of this button click event because we ain't. We, we ain't. Boy, I'll, I'll, I'll never get promoted uh, <laughs> with this. I hope no one's watching yeah. these videos. Um, you, you will not uh, um, need that code because you don't have a button anymore. So now we run it, and guess what? What? It's still not going to work. Why not? I always like to pr tell you when it's not going to work so you don't think I just messed it up. All right? Oh, you did take it out of the HTML. Oh, well, I deleted the whole button, so that got rid of that as well. So now if we look at the HTML, we have, we no longer have a button anywhere in there. And we have on the drop down, drop down on selected item index change, run this code, which is in this file. But we're still missing one piece. What are the pieces that we're missing? I'll give you a hint. If we can just have lights for just a split second. What happened before when we changed it to lion and we didn't click the submit button? Nothing happened before when we changed the drop down and clicked the submit button. Why did nothing happen before? Because we didn't make it back to the server. All right? If I change this, and I don't click the, if I don't have a submit button to click, I need a way to tell that, hey, when you change this value, go to the server. Because the server has a code, it's no longer with the button, the code's associated with the drop down, but the server has the code to do this change. So we need to get back to the server. And simply changing the drop down doesn't get back to the server. Unless, guess what we have to change on the drop down to make it go to the server? You should know the answer to this. Maybe not specifically, but a property. A property. Exactly. If you don't know the answer to something, say change a property. All right, just shout it out. In, in all your classes, it doesn't even matter. All right, in, in an English class, say change a property, you know. Um, but what is the property for the drop down that we want to change? The property is. Auto postback. Auto postback says when you change the drop down, go and redisplay, uh, go and send, uh, send, uh, uh, submit it back to the server so that the server can process. So now when we go and run this, yeah. Now when I go and run this. I change the value of this. Okay. Ah, I gotta get rid of the is valid too. My mistake. Ah, uh, yeah. So now when we go and run this, if I make a selection, shows the second line picture, shows the orangutan. Let's review what I did to make this work without a button. All right? First thing I did, I got rid of the button. All right? Second thing I did, I took the code that was in the on button click event and I put it in a event associated with the drop down. How did I create that event? Simply by double clicking the drop down. Double clicking the drop down created the event in the uh, code and it also associated the drop down with that event. I then paste the code in from the button, getting rid of the if is valid. All right, small 
catch that. Getting rid of the is valid. I then had to go in and make the drop down auto post back. Of course. All right. We can also see the auto post back over here. Yes. That means auto post back means that when you change the drop down, it submits it to the server. Questions on this? Yes. What about the, the validation? What about the validation? Excellent. Well, the validation will occur when I try to go to the server. So, I don't want the validation ever to display initially, right? That, you know, to yell at them, hey, you should pick something. Well, you didn't have a chance to pick anything. Give me a break. Well, now if I pick this, <laughs> it'll show me that. If I go up and pick that, it gives me the validation error. All right, so it doesn't really, um, doesn't really uh, matter. I could, if I wanted to, well, I, I don't know. I could probably write code to blank out the lion image if I, if I didn't want to keep it, but uh, I'm not going to uh, worry about that. Uh, Other questions? All right. We'll see you over in lab. I'll go unlock the lab. I'll come back here to grab the files that I need, and then I'll be back over there.